Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to more Warhammer 40k lore. Since we covered the Elysian Drop Troopers just the other week, I figured it would make sense with another Imperial Armor entry today, with the Aeronautica Imperialis' Valkyrie. The Valkyrie is a 13-ton multi-purpose atmospheric attack craft. It has the ability to carry both cargo and troopers, as well as a wide array of weapon systems, primarily mounted on external pylons. The Valkyrie also has VTOL capabilities, or vertical takeoff and landing giving the vehicle tremendous strategic flexibility as it is able to operate from forward positions that other aircraft couldn't even dream of operating from. Now, of course, the Valkyrie would still prefer a hardened paved surface for its landing and liftoff, as fully loaded it probably weighs around 16, 17 odd tons, not the kind of stuff you would like to set down on a muddy country road, but the ability to operate without the need for a runway alone is a major strategic advantage, as most conventional aircraft will require hundreds of meters, if not indeed kilometers, of runway. And it is, first and foremost, this strategic flexibility that makes the Valkyrie so popular amongst Imperial commanders. For, you see, whilst its ability to transport troops is neato cheeto, there are, as we mentioned in the Elysian video, very few Imperial Guard regiments actually trained with the appropriate doctrines to engage in airborne operations from Valkyries as offensive and mobile platforms. For the vast majority of Imperial Guard regiments, the best you can hope for is that they will sit quietly in the rear troop compartment and wait to disembark until the rearward ramp is fully lowered. Anything more complicated than that is likely to lead to a significant spike in blue-on-blue -blue casualty generation. And even in those instances where specialized regiments are available, more often than not the Valkyries attached to these formations are done so on a more or less permanent basis, as it requires, yet again, a tremendous amount of training, coordination and practice to operate heavy gunships in close consort with infantry without accidents. And since we described those sorts of operations to my satisfaction last week, today we are going to focus primarily on independent wings of Valkyries, operating first and foremost as Aeronautica Imperialis forces. Obviously, they will be cooperating with Imperial Guard commanders, but they will be called upon as needed, rather than dedicated to the support of individual formations. So. What are the values of a Valkyrie, and why would an Imperial Guard commander want squadrons of them at his command? Well, yet again, we have to return to their strategic and tactical flexibility as the greatest advantage of the Valkyrie. For example, in an invasion scenario, Valkyries can be deployed alongside the vanguard of Imperial Guard formations, directly from orbit as it has re-entry capabilities, whereupon it can operate in cooperation with Imperial Guard officers on site on an immediate and short notice. Whereas other Imperial Aeronautica units, like Thunderbolts, Lightnings and Marauders, will all require dedicated launch facilities, which in the early hours and days of an invasion will be provided by Imperial Navy carriers. This is a far, far from ideal situation, as 1. Bringing any Imperial vessel with launch capabilities that close to a planet will place it at tremendous danger from enemy orbital defenses, and even ships, as a vessel maneuvering in low orbit like that is not going to be able to react quickly to any emergent threats. Furthermore, even if the vehicles can be launched safely, the operational endurance of the aircraft will be at its absolute minimum, as the process of re-entry and eventual escape from the planet's gravity both require tremendous amounts of energy, meaning that the aircraft will have to reserve the majority of its fuel simply to get to and from the target. 
whereas the Valkyrie can be deployed in atmosphere and continuously operate in atmosphere with only minimal preparations. Deploy a few construction units alongside it and it will take them, at most hours, to plop down a couple 20 by 20 meters prefabricated permacrete slabs to serve as landing and takeoff platforms. After that, you will of course need to transport down fuel bunkers to be buried in the ground, the pumping facilities, rearmament and recharging facilities as well. But in comparison to building an entire airport, this is nothing and can be done in days rather than weeks and months. Furthermore, the Valkyrie and its variants, which we will also delve into in this video, can do pretty much any job you ask of them. The standard Valkyrie is capable of supporting troops both against hard and soft targets. It can also ferry reinforcements around and supplies, and it can do so in virtually any environment whatsoever. Being both a atmosphere and void cable vessel, it obviously comes with a sealed cockpit, meaning that even in toxic or poisonous environments, the Valkyrie can operate. And with a service ceiling of 13,000 meters, there is pretty much nowhere on the planet it can't get to. For reference, Mount Everest is only about 9,000 meters tall. And with the usual rugged construction of Imperial vehicles, most natural hazards will only prove minor inconveniences to the Valkyrie, which has operated on everything from deep desert worlds to equally deep frozen tundra worlds, to volcano planets, to jungles, to urban worlds, to toxic worlds, etc, etc. The Valkyrie has operated in pretty much every single environment that the 41st millennium has to offer, and it has conquered every one of them. Of course, some are a bit more of a mechanical nightmare for the ground staff than others, but by and large the Valkyrie can fly in pretty much anything. This flexibility does come at a cost, however. Whilst the Valkyrie is capable of doing pretty much anything and everything, it isn't that great at all of its duties. For example, the Valkyrie could be used as a logistical craft, carrying reinforcements and supplies to units that are cut off or who find themselves in difficult or dangerous terrain. But a single Valkyrie can only carry about a squad or so of troopers, or around about a ton, maybe two, of cargo. That might sound like a decent amount, but not really. Ten men is a valuable reinforcement to a platoon, maybe, but for a regiment, it's next to nothing. And one or two tons of supplies, again, next to nothing. To give you a bit of a frame of reference here, during our own Second World War, the Germans did a little bit of a whoopsie on the Eastern Front, one of several in fact, leading to the formation of what is known as the Demyansk Pocket, where some 90 odd thousand German troops were surrounded by the Soviet Red Army. Cut off from regular conventional supplies, the forces needed to be supplied entirely by the air, something that Goering reassured Hitler that he was capable of doing. So how much supplies were we actually talking about here? A hundred thousand men. Okay, that's a, that's a fair number. How much do you think they need to remain combat effective? Well, the answer is about 270 tons. Every single day. 270 tons of supplies every 24 hours just to maintain basic combat readiness. Yeah. Armies require ridiculous quantities of supplies, and they require them constantly. Attempting to supply any large formation via Valkyries only is a very poor idea, and almost certainly doomed to failure. Not to mention it would probably be the single most expensive way to supply any military unit, but 
In a pinch, the Valkyries can provide logistical support, and they don't need to just carry, generally use logistics either. In certain cases, you need access to specialized equipments, demolition charges, las guns, autocannons, heavy bolters, rocket launchers, and other heavy weapons that might otherwise have a very hard time getting there. For example, whilst carrying ten troopers to reinforce a front high up in the mountains wouldn't be all that useful, really. Carrying up a las cannon all the way up there, which will otherwise have to be maneuvered up treacherous mountain paths, that is very valuable. The same would go for personnel as well. Whilst aforementioned ten troopers might not be all that valuable, a crack sniper, or an officer on an inspection tour, or medical personnel or medivac services, which is something else the Valkyrie could be used for, or demolition experts, etc., and the wide variety of specialized servicemen in the Imperial Guard can tip a battle in their favor if deployed effectively and rapidly when and where needed. Needed. And so there is absolutely precious utility in a Valkyrie's transport capacity, it's just not going to be its main job. As a Valkyrie squadron's primary occupations, particularly during the early hours of an invasion, where they are the only support available, is rapid reaction and interception duties. As even the basic Valkyrie comes with either two Hellstrike missiles in underwing mounted weapons pylons or two rocket pods, in addition to a hull-mounted multilaser, and usually two heavy bolters operated by side-door gunners. Though the heavy bolters may often be removed, whilst the Valkyrie is uh, carrying out to or from orbital operations, as generally speaking, if you are entering or leaving a plan's gravity well, you don't want massive gaping holes in the side of your hull. But assuming the Valkyrie has been prepared for atmospheric operations, well, again, one multi-laser, two heavy bolters, and two either held strikes or rocket pods is a fair bit of firepower, particularly when that firepower can move at over a thousand kilometers per hour. Now, granted, good luck effectively deploying most of those weapon systems at that kind of speed, but it does mean that the Valkyrie can be placed relatively far away from the front line and still be able to react quickly. You can place the Valkyries and their vertical takeoff and landing pans along with support equipment, ammunition, energy, rechargers, and fuel over a hundred kilometers from the front line and the Valkyrie will still be able to respond probably within 10 minutes. So let us talk about that response, shall we? As it will give us a good idea of what the Valkyrie and its variants will be used for. Let us assume a flexible and effective squadron, containing a number of standard Valkyries, along with Vulture gunships and Vendetta heavy gunships with each having its own specialization and role in a larger, well-functioning squadron. Beginning, of course, with the Valkyrie. In all due likelihood, the Valkyrie will make up the vast majority of the squadron and will, de facto, be the star of the show, with the Vultures and the Vendettas supporting the Valkyries in whatever they're currently doing. Perhaps they're delivering troops directly into the hearts of the enemy in an airborne assault, but more likely they're carrying out support operations, delivering reinforcements, delivering supplies, or simply attacking enemy ground targets. In this case, the Valkyrie is of course again well equipped with a nose-mounted multi-laser, capable of dealing with most infantry very easily, and two heavy bolters. Again, a lot of anti-infantry firepower, and the multi-laser 2 has the ability to engage light vehicles and some heavy infantry as well. But the true stars of the show are of course the weapons mounted on the external weapons pylons, either a pair of Hellstrike missiles or a pair of rocket pods. The Hellstrike missile is a hunter-killer missile, which in Imperial lingo means it hunts, it kills. <laughs> Honestly, that's about the best <laughs> best explanation I can give. Now, there are two crew members 
in the Valkyrie. One of them is the pilot, the other is the navigator, but one would assume that the navigator pulls double duty as a weapons officer, as I very much so doubt that the job of navigating would require all of his time and attention, especially when you're simply just, you know, attacking something and flying within atmosphere. Maybe in void engagements, but the Valkyrie's not really made for that kind of stuff either. And in high altitude flying, possibly as a um, primary sensors officer, but we're gonna more or less assume that he's going to be operating some of the weaponry too. Before we wander too far off the topic, the Hunter Killer Missile has a target designated for it by, presumably, the Navigator slash Weapons Officer, probably using some form of contrast or TV targeting system. But after this point, the weapon itself is capable of guiding and manoeuvring onto the target all by its lonesome, using an internal Logi engine and nose-mounted sensory systems. Now this is all a little bit of loose waffle of the 40k variant, but presumably what we're looking at here is some sort of a optical guided missile with an internal, not AI obviously, but again, logical engine. Basically, the weapons officer finds a tank, or a bunker, or a cluster of infantry, or light vehicles, or whatever he wants killed, and he goes, that. And once designated, the weapon follows that target wherever it goes until it makes impact on the target, capable of engaging in maneuvers and correcting its flight path as it goes, and of course, tracking the target even through evasive maneuvers. The missile is also capable of making relatively sophisticated changes in its own direction, allowing it to potentially, and technically, avoid simple obstacle like, for example, a ridge, so allowing the Valkyrie to fire over a hill, or past a small shrubbery of trees, etc. The missile is by no stretch of the imagination maneuverable enough to weave its way through complex terrain, but so long as we're talking about relatively simple and singular obstacles, the Hunter Killer missile should be able to fire around corner, presuming, again, its target has already been designated. This also allows the Valkyrie to technically engage in some air-to-air -air combat as well. Now, the primary purpose of the Hunter Killer missile is dealing with enemy medium to heavy heavy armor, as it carries a shaped charge warhead. But there are variants on the Hunter Killer missiles. Several, in fact, and presumably some of them have some sort of explosive fragmentation tip as well, as it has been known indeed to engage enemy aircraft. Now you do not want to be engaging enemy air superiority fighters in a Valkyrie. <laughs> you are going to be drastically outmaneuvered and probably outran by a significant degree as well, not to mention the air superiority fighter is going to be carrying weapons far better suited to the job at hand than you, but in a pinch, Valkyries can carry out limited air superiority missions. The second option, the rocket pod, is, well, just that. It is a big old fat drum of dumb fire rockets. Not very accurate, but you can fire a hell of a lot of them a hella quickly. Perfect for suppressing defenders or wiping out clusters of enemy infantry. Now, considering it's already carrying a multi-laser and two heavy bolters, this additional saturation bombardment ability seems a pinch superfluous. But, again, suppression might be the primary purpose. If you can fire one 100mm rocket at a target every two, three seconds, for example, you're gonna make damn sure that whomever is occupying that bunker isn't gonna be poking his nose out anytime soon. And with each drum containing many, many, many missiles, dozens in fact, you can keep up that barrage for a very long period of time. But yet again, the key word for the Vulture is flexibility. It can engage vehicles, it can engage infantry, it can even, at a pinch, engage heavy armor and enemy flyers. But it's not the best of any at it, because it does sacrifice a great deal of offensive power for the additional cargo and carrying capacity. This is where its support aircraft come into play. First and foremost, the Vulture gunship. 
The vulture is essentially a Valkyrie on steroids. Sacrificing the cargo compartment and the side-mounted heavy bolters to instead carry six weapons pylons. Usually, two of these are dedicated to some sort of direct fire weaponry, either a multi-laser, a las cannon, or an auto cannon, with the other four being dedicated to hellstrike missiles or rocket pods, doubling the anti-tank or anti-infantry firepower of a Valkyrie. You can even switch out the two direct fire weapons, leaving it with only a single nose mounted heavy bolter, but a potential six hunter killer missiles. This would probably be the configuration of the dedicated anti air aircraft in the squadron, as even if one or two missiles might go away, six of them is likely to do some damage to whomever is bothering the squadron from up on high. It also gives it the ability to engage even super heavy armor with a reasonable degree of success, as a Bane Blade of course ain't going to blow up from just one or two of these things, but six. That's gonna cause some damage, no doubt about it. Alternatively, it can also carry all rocket pods as well, if you really want to make sure that an entire gun line can't peek their heads up, or bombs or smart bombs. Now, the bomb is, well, self-explanatory, it's a bomb. A big bomb? Up to a thousand five hundred pounds big bomb, or over half a ton of explosives, but still, but a single bomb. Now, carrying out bombing runs in a Valkyrie seems ill-advised, honestly, particularly with dumb fire ordnance, but yet again, in the name of all holy suppression, or simply saturation bombing an area with multiple of them, they can get something done, whereas the smart bombs are probably the better bet. As a vulture equipped with six smart bombs, presumably of relative equal tonnage to the heavy bombs, would be an excellent bunker buster or emplacement destroyer. Presuming you've done a little bit of recon before the attack, vultures can sweep in at up to 11,000 meters, only slightly lesser elevation ceiling than the Valkyrie, and drop pinpoint position ordnance right on top of the enemy's heaviest defenses, with particular attention no doubt being paid to enemy anti-air positions, as again, a Valkyrie, although capable of flying at over a thousand kilometers per hour, is obviously going to need to slow down a lot to deliver troops, and any attempt to use the rocket pods or the direct fire weaponry at a thousand kilometers is going to end very, very poorly in all due likelihood, as um, accuracy is not going to be much of a topic at that point, meaning the Valkyrie is going to have to slow down, making itself an easier target. With vultures dropping smart bombs on located enemy anti-air positions, that will make their engagement in the battle a lot safer, and make sure that any troops carried on board will actually get to the dirt without getting blown to bits in a very, very, very expensive aircraft explosion. Now, one could refer to this as a seed operation, a suppression of enemy air defenses, in case you're wondering, but not Really, like one of one of the well, sort of yes, kind of no. What tends to exemplify modern day seed operations is using passive guidance weaponry to lock on to the enemy's radar signature. As normally speaking, when you're firing against an aircraft, you will have a targeting radar actually pinging the aircraft, going, it's over there, it's over there, and then a weapon using the targeting data gained from the targeting system to actually head towards the aircraft. A seed missile would then pick up on the radar and simply follow the radar home, blowing the designator to bits and pieces. Now, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, any indications that the Imperium is quite that sophisticated, but well, simply bombing the ever-living shit out of the enemy's AA positions, well, I, it, it sort of, kinda counts, in a way. But the only truly acceptable weapons configuration for the Vulture is, of course, the Twin Punisher Gatling Cannon one. 
Now, unfortunately, the precise stats of this weapon are not known within the 41st millennium, but we can look at its obvious inspiration, the American GAU-8 Avenger, and make an educated guess as to the capabilities of the Punisher Gatling Cannon. Famously, of course, mounted on the A-10 Thunderbolt, this is a 30 millimeter fully automatic Gatling cannon weapon with a rate of fire of upwards of 4,000 rounds per minute. <laughs> oh, oh that, that, that is something. And of course, with ammo of that size, 30 millimeters, you will shred any infantry formation with contemptuous ease, no doubt, but even light vehicles will be pounded into scrap metal, not so much due to the penetrative force of each individual bullet, but rather the sheer kinetic torrent of energy being hammered into the hull. Even medium and heavier tanks need to be wary of a weapon like this, as again, the sheer, repeated, unceasing kinetic impact will cause serious damage. And if you're firing something like depleted uranium rounds or other super dense materials, oh, you best not be too sure that one or two of those aren't going to get inside the tank and start rattling around as well. Really, the only downside with the Punisher Gatling Cannon is the fact that it is, in all due likelihood, ridiculously heavy, and its ammunition scarcely any less so, giving it a very, very, very limited actual ammunition capacity. The aforementioned ever so famous A-10 Warthog, for example, despite being a chonky boy, only carried about a thousand odd rounds for its Gatling Cannon, giving it about 20 odd seconds of actual firepower. And even then, with that relatively limited ammunition loadout, the gun and ammo still makes up about two tenths of the total weight of the A-10 Warthog. In the case of a Vulture, oh boy, um, I would be very surprised if it carried more than 40 seconds of ammo, absolute tops, and even then, I doubt it. 10, 20 seconds is probably a more realistic estimate, meaning that the Vulture with the Punishers had better pick its targets very, very carefully, because once those ginormous guns are dry, it's dead weight in the sky and needs to head on back to base to have its ammunition drums replaced. You might also be wondering, though, why even bother with a Punisher Gatling cannon, or rocket pods, or direct fire weaponry, or anything like that? Surely you would just slap as many Hellstrike missiles on it as possible, or the Hell Fury missile, which is a missile variant unique to the Vulture, which fires tiny little bomblets of incendiary devices which is always fun, well, it's because the Vulture isn't actually the anti-tank variant of the Valkyrie. It is more along the lines of a general fire support thing. It is designed to come in right after or right before the Valkyries and protect them or suppress the enemy from attacking them whilst they're on their approach whilst they're deploying their troops. The Vultures will then hang back and spend any ammunition they've got left, supporting the infantry or making sure that anything that threatens the Valkyries doesn't do so for very long, because the actual dedicated anti-tank variant is the Vendetta the heavy gunship, and it more than deserves its name as it carries into battle six LAS cannons in three twin-linked weapon pods. Not only is that enough anti-tank firepower to make even Super Heavies a little bit nervous around the Vendetta, but crucially, unlike the Hunter Killer missiles, the LAS cannons can simply keep firing. You haven't expended the weapon once you've shot it, and you can re-engage the same target again and again if required, or attack different targets as they present themselves on the battlefield. Now, obviously, the LAS cannons are going to have to draw their power from somewhere, and in this case it is going to be, in all due likelihood, significantly sized internal batteries mounted in the Vendetta's 
crew compartment. It still has the ability to use two door-mounted heavy bolters, mind you, so it clearly hasn't filled up the entire crew compartment, unlike the Vulture. But I imagine there's a very, 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 very large power cell back there. Now, normally, a LAS cannon is only good for one shot. That will expend the entire power cell, and you then need to de facto reload it. LAS cannons carried by heavier infantry, like the Space Marines with their massive backpacks, are good for maybe a couple dozens of shots. And LAS cannons mounted on major vehicles are clearly good for a hell of a lot more than that again. Now, since the Vendetta is not quite as heavy or as bulky as a tank, we're probably looking at an ammunition capacity somewhere in between a Devastator carried LAS cannon and a tank. If I were to venture a very, very, very wild and rough guess, I'd probably say 20 to 40 shots per battery of two. Presuming that the weapons are all discharged at once, that will give you 40 weapons barrages. Or alternatively, you could fire them each in turn for a total of 120 twin-linked shots. Now that is a pure guess, mind you, and I could well see the ammunition capacity being actually a lot less than that, but theoretically, that gives you the ability to engage armored vehicles with the fall of firepower of the Vendetta 40 times. That is a lot of dead enemy armor, and the Vendetta is still, of course, a Valkyrie gunship, giving it tremendous maneuverability far beyond that of, well, practically any other LAS cannon carrying vehicle. Even a Devastator with the added mobility of a Space Marine can only move so fast, whereas the Vendetta still has the maximum top speed of the Valkyrie of over a thousand kilometers per hour and the same operational ceiling of 13,000 meters. Now, I would imagine that the LAS cannon's actual effective range is going to be a hell of a lot less than that, obviously, but, well, there is a reason why LAS cannons are one of the primary weapons for Imperial craft in air-to-air -air dogfights, because the beam moves hilariously quickly, and so you can actually lock on and attack a target very, very very fast, to the point where the Vendetta could potentially also be another air superiority candidate, but, well, a thousand kilometers per hour is a lot for a Valkyrie, but less than half the speed of, say, for example, a lightning interceptor. And in these kinds of dogfights with actual guns, speed is everything as the faster party gets to choose when the engagement happens, how it happens, and most crucially of all, from what direction it's going to be happening in. The Valkyrie's only got forward-firing guns. It can only cover a relatively small area in front of it, and against a target moving more than twice as quickly, making sure that your guns are pointed towards the enemy and not the other way around is going to be no mean feat. So the Vendetta will probably stick to its intended role of anti-tank killer. Because, again, whilst it's not more maneuverable than a lightning or a thunderbolt, it is a hell of a lot more maneuverable than a fat old tank waffling across the battlefield. The Vendetta can use the terrain to its advantage, using other surveillance systems or friendly aircraft to keep a track of its targets, whilst maneuvering closer using the natural lay of the land, ridges or hills to mask its approach. This is a tactic much used by our own combat helicopters today, as, as heavy a gunship as, say, an Apache might be, it responds exceedingly poorly to incoming weapons fire, and so you need to be able to keep an eye on the target, pop up and kill it before it has an opportunity to shoot back. Now in this regard, the Valkyries are actually pretty goddamn well armoured, with universal armour coverage of 75 millimetres. That is actually genuinely rather absurd and transforms a damn near into a flying tank. 
In fact, no, literally, flying tank is a very apt description. For comparison, the Illusion 2 of Soviet World War II fame, also described as the flying tank, only had up to, at max, 12 millimeters of armor. And even then, the total armor weight on the IL-2 was something along the lines of 700 kilograms. And that was not uniform. 12 millimeters either, meaning that the Valkyrie, fully covered with 75 millimeters of armor plating, well, out of its total tonnage of 9 to 13 odd tons, probably a solid third to a fourth of that is just armor. And yet, even then, it is capable of vertical takeoff and landings. The engines on the Valkyrie must be absolutely, absurdly powerful to have any chance to lift this ridiculous hunk of armor into the air. And just to hammer home the point, one of the most popular upgrades to a Valkyrie that is expected to carry out extended operations in atmosphere and in direct fire support roles is extra armor. <laughs> Why not? Now granted, that is extra armor in critical locations, like fuel tanks or main energy storage or cockpits, etc. But even so, you're taking something that already carries tons of armor plating and adding on even more of it. But hey, the thing is, of course, that in the far-flung future, in the 41st millennium, the standard anti-tank weaponry is firing well, concentrated sunbeams, essentially, which can melt through the armor of a main battle tank like butter. You're probably going to want the extra protection. And whilst even the 75 millimeters of armor that a Valkyrie carries is not going to prove all that powerful in the face of a LAS cannon, on the right side, anything short of an auto cannon is probably going to bounce off quite harmlessly. And whilst we're amazing at the Valkyrie's incredible engine capacity, we might as well have a look at the actual logistical and transport variety as well, the Sky Talon. Now, we briefly mentioned this in the previous video too, but the Sky Talon really is a rather unique modification of the Valkyrie, and frankly, a technological wonder, as it maintains pretty much the exact same dimensions as the Valkyrie, retains its top speed of a thousand kilometers per hour, and only drops a single kilometer's worth of service ceiling, yet is now capable of carrying light armor onto the battlefield. Oh, well, light armor might be overselling the Tauros and the Sentinel a little, but no, no, I, I think they, they fit the description. And a single Sentinel is seven tons, and the Sky Talon can carry two of them. That is 14 tons of cargo, which is more than the weight of the Sky Talon itself. Impressive. Very, very impressive. The Sky Talon, as the name implies, gives up the centrally mounted cargo compartment to install instead a large magnetic lifting clamp. This allows it, as mentioned, to carry either two Sentinels or one Tauros straight into battle. These are deployed then directly from the belly of the aircraft, which then swiftly begins leaving the combat zone. Because whilst the Sky Talon is not entirely unarmed, as it has a single nose-mounted heavy bolter, and usually two weapons hardpoints, either for hunter-killer missiles or rocket pods, it is not a stand-up-and-fight vehicle. Plus, due to their relatively new design, they're also very, very rare. And due to their enormous flexibility as logistics and supply craft, they're probably going to be viewed as very valuable and precious commodities. Because as we talked about previously, supplying units via Valkyries is probably a complete and utter waste of time. But with the Sky Talon, which also has the ability to carry a special underslung pod in its magnetic bay, well, 
All of that can be supplies, and since we know it can carry two sentinels for 14 tons, then surely a more comfortably sized and designed drop pod for supplies will at least be as large, and probably larger still. But even if we assume only, only, quote-unquote, 14 tons, well, that's still pretty comparable to the load capacity of a C-130 Hercules, which can carry about 20-odd tons. So yeah, the Sky Talon is more than capable of making a serious dent in the logistical needs of a regiment, to the point where, if you've got enough of them, they could actually be a realistic way of supporting regiments in extreme conditions, where supporting them via road or other means would simply not be possible. Due to, again, its vertical takeoff and landing, you could, for example, support regiments deep in jungled conditions, as all you would need to do is hover it above the canopy, make sure there's no one underneath you, and then release the gravitic hooks, letting the supplies fall a few meters down onto the ground where it can be picked up by the soldiers. The ability to deliver light vehicles as well is, of course, again, cute and adorable, but honestly, the Sky Talent's primary purpose, in my opinion, should be as a special needs logistic vehicle. Because again, you are going to be burning a hilarious quantity of Prometheum keeping this damn thing in the sky. You are not going to be wanting this to ferry supplies to just regular old line regiments that could have been supplied easily well via truck, but due to its maneuverability, literally anywhere, as it is an aircraft, and its capability to bring along considerable amounts of supplies and light vehicles, which could themselves also carry supplies yet further, well, they allow for some really deep operations behind enemy lines, in areas where the enemy would consider it impossible for Imperial Guard forces to actually operate. Granted, you are going to need a bold Imperial Guard commander to risk such a valuable asset, not to mention the regiment they're presumably supporting in such a daring way, but imagine the blocking operations you could carry out with something like this. Imagine, as we talked about in the previous video, the Market Garden scenario, where you have several choke points that can potentially be severed, but the issue is you've got to hold off massive enemy formations until you can close the pocket. Well, Sky Talons can carry in all of the heavy weapons you require, including light support vehicles, including tons of ammunition, including tons of heavy guns, etc, 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 and keep the troops supplied at the same time. Again, if you mess up, there's going to be a lot of lost equipment, but if you don't, the benefits could be enormous. And with a nice big flight of Valkyries, Vultures, and Vendettas coming along with the Sky Talents, well, you've got yourself a flying army, able to take on damn near anything the enemy could possibly put up against them. And if they're bringing the regiment along with them, so much the better. However, we have now talked about just about everything there is to talk about when it comes to Valkyries and their variants. So, until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.